Happy New Year 2024. We're going to start off the new year with a bang. Today, we're going to do all things coffee grinders. So that's going to be talking about burrs. It's going to be talking about burr geometry. It's going to be talking about the different grinders on the market, feeding mechanisms, um, and, and whatever else that we want to chat about. So, of course, we have people from Patreon in the Q&A. So I'll be responding to some of those. I have my phone here with those questions that will be popping up. But um, yeah, so hopefully everyone had a good end of their 2023. And we're going to go into 2024 hard. All right, let's do this. All right. So as I said today, it's all about burrs. So I've got just loads of burrs sitting on the table so we can point at some examples, chat through them. And like I said, we're going to just talk about um, how to optimize your grinding at home with the grinder you have, because of course, we're anti-FOMO here. We don't want people to get into the rabbit hole of gear acquisition syndrome. You can always, always, always improve your grinder and your grinder um, that was redundant. We can always improve your grinder and grinding experience at home without having to upgrade or do something else. So let's go ahead and talk about these certain fixes, and I'll let people start asking specific questions in the chat, which we'll, we will get to. The first few things I really wanted to say at the beginning of the video, because I think these are super helpful, are just simple tips and tricks to improve your grinding experience at home with your existing grinder. So let's say, first of all, let's say you have a hand grinder. One thing that can immediately help you improve your grinding, um, and this is based off of, uh, I don't have loads of data acquired on this, but I can pretty much guarantee this will help improve your grinding with your hand grinder, is if you tilt your hand grinder as you're grinding, it's going to slow the feed of the beans into the burrs, which is going to give you a better coffee, a better, uh, a better uh, particle output. It might cause you to grind a little finer on the actual settings, but the grind, grind size themselves won't go any finer. Now, the reason for this is because whenever you have a massive load of beans going into the burrs themselves, they are pushing other beans through and it's causing kind of a clog, kind of a jam, because you have a lot of other ones going in trying to get priority of exiting. And so you have them kind of going and they rotate around a little bit longer than they should. And the more that they're rotating around, the more the grounds are rubbing against each other, the more they're going to break, the more they're going to cause heat uh, and, the, and the finer the grind will be. So as you're using your hand grinder, if you tilt it like this to slow the feed down of the beans into the actual burr set, you're going to have a big difference. One crazy person messaged me after I, I made a comment similar to this in a video on my main channel. Um, one person uh, messaged me and said they were going to do it uh, bean by bean. It took them like 10 minutes to do it, but they were curious. So they had dialed in a coffee and then uh, by just dumping the beans in and then they went bean by bean. The grounds were much coarser but the particle distribution optically looked a whole lot better. And so then he went finer in order to compensate for that coarser grind size and said that it was a night and day difference. Now, I don't have the patience to do that. So kudos to that person who did that. But um, yeah, so as, if you can have a clean burr set, as clean as possible, so that the throughput of each individual bean is as clear as possible, as quick as possible, that is ideal for a good coffee experience. Of course, you can have a good coffee experience dumping all the beans in at once and holding it like this and grinding. But if you slow down the feed rate into the burr chamber itself, you are going to have a more consistent uh, and, a, and just a superior efficiency when it comes to the contact between the beans themselves and the burrs. All right. So the idea when we're grinding is we want to lessen the amount of heat damage that applies to the, burr, the grounds, which is a massive factor in the taste of your coffee. And we want the throughput to be as efficient as possible. So that leads me to the next thing, which is simply put, with any grinder you have at home, you will benefit from a slow feed. Now, th this can be very annoying unless you have some sort of 3D printed mechanism that will do it for you, but slow feeding any grinder will improve your particle consistency and will lessen the heat damage of the grounds themselves. So all I mean by that is you take, um, you take a dosing cup, you put your beans in it, and you just slowly feed it into your grinder. Now, this is the same idea as tilting your hand grinder. What it's going to do is more slowly feed the beans into the burrs so that the burrs can be more efficient with each individual bean. If you overload that burr set, as I said, then they're going to get caught in there because the, the pre-breaker, so we'll use a cone burr for this. As you can see in a cone burr, 
there's massive gap up here, all right? Beans can easily fit in that gap, and they will. They'll go in there quickly. And that initial pre-breaking system is so incredibly efficient that it will immediately pulverize those beans into smaller particles. And then they get stuck trying to leave the burr set. And they don't just they don't just freely go through. The first 10 beans aren't the first 10 beans out. That's a very difficult thing to, to ensure of when you're grinding your coffee. Because those pre-breakers are so efficient, everything's pulverized, and they're waiting to get out. So they kind of just sit there and they let the burr spin them. And as they're spinning, they go finer and finer and finer and finer. And this is a very easy thing to prove as well. I believe even Hoffman has done this in a video. But what if you if you slowly feed even a niche grinder, you're going to have a much coarser grind than what you previously had. And so you can test this at home with any grinder. Very simply put, dial in an espresso. It's easier to see the effects on espresso, of course. Dial in an espresso with just dumping the beans in and letting it go, and then slowly feed on a second one at the same dial, slowly feed your beans, just tap, 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 let the beans barely trickle in and pull a shot. It will go much, much faster. You'll shed eight to 10 seconds off your extraction time because the particle sizes are much coarser and arguably there should be less fines, micro fines created because you're not mashing those grounds against other grounds uh, before exit and the heat dam damage should be lessened. Now, this isn't true in every grinder because something like cone burrs are very inefficient and tend to cause a lot of heat up. Flat burrs do as well, especially the smaller you go because you have less throughput, you have less uh, efficient throughput the smaller you go, but it will improve, um, it will improve or, or I guess take away a lot of that potential heat damage that's going to occur. Now, heat damage is not a new concept. We've known about it for a long time. And in fact, heat damage is what makes the Mythos grinders so terrible. They are intentionally heating up the gr grind chamber because they want consistency from when you start and the burrs are cold and the chamber is cold. Instead of having that cold and then it turns hot, they just heat it up so that it's hot always. And that turns out giving you really gross coffees, essentially. So people have known about the, the effects of heating. In fact, my friend Christian Klatt, who now works with Weber Workshops, years ago, I believe in 2016, he put up some videos online from a conference where he talked about burr heat up and what the issue was there. And so there is a big issue inherent in grinding everything at once, especially when you don't have any sort of mechanism to start the breaking before hitting the burrs. Which brings me to the next thing, which is I believe pre-breakers are, uh, and this will be the last thing before we jump into burrs and more specific grinder questions, but I believe wholeheartedly that pre-breakers um, that are separate from the burrs as well as augers are the next big step I know they've already been around for many years, but not all these grinders have been adopting it just yet. But pre-breakers and augers are both incredibly important in order to have the most optimal grounds you can get out of your grinder. Now, of course, we could talk about particle size distributions, but no one really has any proof as to how that affects the cup. And that's why I don't really think they're very helpful when we're assessing a grinder. We can say grinder A has a more unimodal peak than grinder B, so grinder A should have more clarity. But in reality, that doesn't always work that way. In fact, it very rarely works that way. There are many times you'll have a more unimodal peak and it won't taste very good and it might not have any clarity. It's a very difficult area where we don't have any sufficient sensory experiments to really dictate what is going on. On top of that, particle size distribution units like imaging units and laser diffraction units, they struggle in certain realms. Laser diffraction struggles in the fines area. Imaging units tend to assume that boulders or that clumps between fines and grounds are boulders. And there's a lot of issues and there's an airplane passing over. So sorry about that audio. But so there are a lot of issues in trying to ascertain anything objective from this data. We can look for trends, which is very helpful, but just saying, oh, this one's more unimodal than this one, therefore more clarity in grinder A as opposed to grinder B. That's not super helpful. What we can know is that lessening heat damage and improving our, uh, by at least lessening heat damage will improve our coffee experience. Uh, and, and so we want to do something that will uh, lessen it as much as possible. We also don't want there to be um, as much mashing and grinding as there are cuts. So essentially when we're grinding coffee, we want it to be cuts from the burrs. We want it to be direct influence on the grounds. Whereas whenever we have a slow feed through, we have a, 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 um, 
a, a backup, a traffic jam in the birds themselves, what's going to happen is the grounds will rub against grounds and that's causing braking as well. It's also increasing static and it's increasing heat generation. So even though, yes, that sounds like I'm saying a more bimodal distribution and moving it to more unimodal is a good thing, it's not necessarily that that I'm saying. I'm saying it's better to let the birds do the talking as opposed to the grounds arbitrarily rubbing other grounds because there's a backup in the system. Okay? That makes sense? All right. If there are questions, again, for the people watching this live who are part of Patreon, feel free to ask questions and I will get to them in a second, which uh, makes me say that augers and pre-breakers both are massively important to lessen heat generation, which is a very obvious logical thing, and also very important in order to feed the burrs at a constant rate. So there's, uh, this has been well known. Samo Smirke has been talking about this for years now, but they have, it's very objective that the very beginning of the grounds coming out when you full dose a coffee are much coarser than the ones in the middle and much, uh, and then the earlier ones are similar to the ones at the very end because there's no weight pushing it down. So you have essentially two major different particle size distributions in one dose. And that's because at the very beginning, there's no grounds in the way of the initial beans going through. So they have a quick throughput. And then the traffic jam occurs, all of those experience a finer grind because of the rubbing. And then once those go through and it's just the last bit, those tend to be a little bit different as well. It's not the same as the first bit going through, but it goes back to being a little coarser because there's nothing pushing it, no traffic jam, and you have popcorning. And those popcorn beans tend to experience a coarser grind size because you don't have that pushing, you don't have that regrinding. Okay, so when I say regrinding, by the way, I don't really mean the, bur the grounds exit and re-enter the burrs. That's silly. What I'm saying is they sit in there, they get ground by the burrs, and then they're reground by themselves. As they're sitting there spinning, you have the burrs, and they're sitting there spinning. They're going around, going around, going around, going around. The grounds get caught inside at the finishing teeth, and they can't escape yet because there's grounds that are already trying to escape. So it's that's the bottleneck of, of grinding. You have a bottleneck, and that's the finishing teeth or the finishing area before the grounds e exit. Obviously, with filter grinding, it's not as big of a deal, but it is still there, and you will still experience an improvement in your grounds, Okay. Okay, so the reason augers and pre-breakers are so important is you are lessening the amount of work on those final burrs. So when you pre-break with an auger, which is always going to pre-break, even in an EK-43, which isn't intentionally a pre-breaker, it still will pre-break your beans. That is already lessening the amount of heat that is going to be created in the final burrs, where the majority of the heat will be created. It's also lessening the workload in the final burr set. And it is meeting the feed rate of the grounds or of those beans into the final burr set. So you drop your beans into an EK, it hits the pre-breaker or the auger, which is feeding it at a consistent rate into the burrs. So it doesn't overload the burrs all at once. Not on top of that, it is pre-breaking them. So you have one break happening here. You're breaking down the grinding into two major steps. You have the pre-breaking happening in the auger and then into the final burrs. And because the burrs are so big, when you do smaller doses, they're insanely efficient because the throughput is very much unperturbed. You have a meted feed into the burrs that are already ground up uh, to an extent. They're kind of into chunks of beans. And so they have a very quick exit. So from the, from the very beginning of touching the burrs to the leaving the burrs, it is a very consistent and, uh, like I said, meted output. Same thing with the Zerno. The Zerno has a more specific pre-breaker, so does the Bentwood, where the auger is tightly fitted to the chamber to be more effective at pre-breaking. Now, it, it's I haven't done any, any data acquisition to see if it's better to have a tightly fitted pre-breaker or an auger that's a bit more loosely fitted. The tighter one will obviously be more aggressive in pre-breaking the beans, whereas the auger that's not a pre-breaker but it is pre-breaking, is not as aggressive. So I, I can't really say which one's better there, but they're both doing the job of slowly feeding those burrs, or not slowly because the EK is at like 17, 60 RPMs, depending on Hertz, but of feeding the beans in a consistent manner to the finishing burrs. Obviously, the bigger the burrs at the end, the less potential heat damage and the more efficient throughput. So that's what we're looking for is efficiency and throughput, which most grinders simply do not have. So if you're looking at like the DF series, they're horizontally mounted. There's no feeding mechanism. You just dump and go. Those are going to experience a lot of that regrind effect, similar with the P100 and the P64. Also, the Titus, even though it's vertically mounted, there's no auger feeding it into it. The Kafetech Monolith, also, you have 
the um, the Aries, which is conical. You have the uh, the niche does have a slow feeder in it, which is the best thing about the niche, but it still suffers from a lot of the regrinding because cone burrs are simply very inefficient with the throughput. You have uh, the EK or the EG1 does not have any type of feeding mechanism, which is why even two years ago or so when I made my EG1 review, I noted that I find it's a lot better tasting when I slow feed it. And I have a little bit better understanding as to why that is. And it's because of the things that I've mentioned so far in this video. So with all of these things, it's very apparent that when you can more slowly feed your, your grinder to get as much efficiency out of your birds as possible and to focus on cuts as opposed to mashing, you're going to have a better coffee experience. Okay, that was my initial rant I wanted to get out of the way. Now let's check out these. Um, all right, so I'm going to I'm going to shift over some Q&As which will be very helpful for anyone watching because they uh, I'll speak in a more general uh, even though they may be about specific grinders I'll try to make it a more generalized understanding of what's going on there so that we can better understand as a community what's happening in grinders. My 078S time more comes this week. Best tips. So an 078 they have it's auger fed. So it is it does a good job at feeding the auger and it has pretty big burrs with those 78 millimeter burrs. So feeding it slowly is still going to improve. Of course, there's quite a bit of popcorning with that. And it's because that auger, uh, it, there's a small opening for those beans to go in. So the auger is, uh, it can be a little bit annoying with popcorning, but even still feeding that in can, can slowly can improve what you're going with that. Now, as far as best tips, I would say I don't actually use RDT on a time more. I like to use the fines collector and I like to get rid of the chaff and the fines that kind of get stuck onto that by using the click system at the end. I know people are divided on that. Some love it, some hate it. I find it incredible. And so I get rid of about half a gram of coffee by the end of the by the end of the grinding by using that. And I toss that and no, I don't use it to brew with. And a lot of that's because it does collect a lot of the chaff, which tends to get very staticky and wants to stick to that. And so without RDT, I'm able to get rid of that. You are losing about half a gram a dose. But for me, it's uh, very apparent on the taste. You can do some ABs and see if, uh, if you have one that you obviously prefer. From a workflow perspective, Sculptor 064S versus DF64 Gen 2. From a workflow perspective, probably the DF64 Gen 2 because it has the deionizer and you can it's a little bit cleaner and it's a little bit faster, but uh, and it has the portafilter forks on it. So technically from a workflow perspective that, but from a taste perspective, I'm going time more. Same way I choose uh, the fellow Ode over a DF64 for filter. A lot of people think, oh, it's the same burr set. They should be the same, but you have to re realize that the burrs are acting differently because the DF is immediately meeting beans, immediately. So right when you put the beans in, the first time they're cracked is with the pre-breaker, or it's not really a pre-breaker, but the first row of cutting teeth on the on the MP burrs, or whatever burrs you're using. I'm just assuming multi-purpose. Uh, on the time more, you have the auger, which is cutting the beans slightly before they're entering. So there's a different dynamic at play between the beans or the shards and the burrs themselves. Okay. Um, using my hand grinder with my Milwaukee cordless drill makes it much better. Yeah, that can make it better for sure. You're still going to suffer from a lot of the things that we've discussed because you're holding it vertically. You could hold it horizontally with that, which it would be better for sure. But with that higher speed, you're still getting a lot of crushing and crash uh, mashing which is not ideal, but it's what are you going to do when you have a conical hand grinder? You can optimize that situation by, you know, tilting it almost horizontally when you're doing it, and that will help slow feed it and will give you a better um, end cup, in my opinion. Let's see. Does the tilted hack work best for espresso or filter? It will work best for both. Uh, it's going to cause more rotations for espresso, obviously, because it's going to more slowly feed it. And you're not going to be using the full efficiency of the pre-breakers. So you'll see probably a 10 or 12 second elongation of grinding time, but you will see a benefit in the cup. And of course, all these things I'm saying, go ahead and test it yourself. Do an AB, pull two shots, go ahead and pre-grind two shots and pull them so they're as fresh as possible. So that temperature and oxidation are not uh, causing a big difference between the two. But go ahead and try two side by side. Do the tilted first and then vertical and then flip. Do vertical first and tilted because there still will be a different bet difference between the espressos. But try that. Do some AB. See if you prefer it. If it's not worth X or 10, 12 seconds, throw it out the window. All we're trying to do is you know, incrementally better our coffee experience. This can stave off FOMO. It can stave off gear acquisition syndrome and can improve your cup experience at home. Uh, what's a better way of aligning burrs than the Sharpie test? 
That's a great question. There are a lot of ways to align burrs. The best is if you can use a dial indicator in order to ensure flatness of the stationary burr with the burr housing itself, and then aligning the rotating burr to that burr. Well, but you also need to ensure that the burr, that the housing is perfectly perpendicular to the to the rod or to the axle itself. If it's not perfectly perpendicular, then obviously uh, if you align that back burr to the burr housing and it's not perfectly perpendicular to the rod itself, then if you align this one to the back burr, they're still going to be off-centered, right? If you do it with the marker test. So I like using, uh, maybe if you have micrometers, you can, you can um, align the rotating burr onto the burr carrier, the rotating burr carrier using micrometers all the way around to make sure that they're all perfectly um, all perfectly aligned, you know, flat, whatever it is. Uh, so you're just measuring, let's say it's, uh, I don't know, let's say it's 112 millimeters on this side from the top of the burr to the bottom of the carrier. You want it to be 112 millimeters on the other side in every quarter or every quadrant. And if it's not, you can, you know, do some shimming in order to make that. But you have to be relying on the tolerances of the manufacturer for that. Otherwise, honestly, the marker test does an okay job. It's not perfect, but it does do an okay job. And it's, it's, uh, the biggest thing though, is I see very often people are going too hard at chirp and too long at chirp in order to test their markers. Do not do that. If you need to go to where it's just barely touching, just barely chirping. If you go too far, you're, it doesn't matter. The burr test doesn't work anymore at all. And I all, and I can tell by how much is wiped off on your burrs. If you are, if you are doing the burr, burr test here, let's, let me get a marker out and I'll show you what I'm talking about. If you're doing the marker test and you have covered the edges with your Expo marker, let me do this. Airplanes are going wild today. People be flying on New Year's Day. All right. So if we, I don't know if you can see, oof, that green marker. But if if when you're done with the marker test and it looks more, and it looks like this, there we go. There we go. Okay. And you have just slightly, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, so I may have to just describe it in words. Essentially, just that outer rim should be wiped off. If you have the whole finishing teeth pretty much wiped off, you went way too hard at chirp. And that does not tell you bull crap about your alignment. So essentially what could be happening there, happening there is if you're putting them together and you go too hard, if they are just barely misaligned, like there's a little gap on the bottom side, for instance, and you go too hard, It'll push them together. It'll force them together. And so if there's a ton wiped off, there's no way you did the marker test correctly. You need to do it again and go very, very, very gentle chirp for just a second. All right. You don't want to sit there and wipe and wipe and wipe and wipe and wipe and wipe because over time, especially if it's really close, uh, it's going to want to wipe off those other parts. So be very gentle on the chirp and don't run it for forever. Don't look because you're going to just give you a false reading. And I, genuinely, I would say 95% of the pictures I see people uploading online are fake or not fake, but they're like pseudo good readings. They're not actually getting proper alignment because they're going too hard on the chirp. You can, of course, force any two burrs together if you push them close enough. That's how you get to burlock. Burlock with misaligned burrs is still perfect burlock. If you get them to where they're fully locked, they are aligned. OK, so the closer you go, the more you're messing up the marker test. So be very aware of that. Let's see. I can confirm slow feeding made the shots go faster with the fellow opus. It'll happen on any grinder you use, any grinder, because it's improving the efficiency of the cutting between the beans and the burrs. It will happen. You can test me on any grinder you have. It doesn't matter. It will give you faster shots because it is going more coarsely. It will also give you a more it will push the peak to the right and give you a bit more unimodality, just a bit. I'm not saying it's gonna be as drastic. Some grinders will be more drastic than others, but it will do that even though that's not our goal. The goal is to rely on the burrs and to give the true essence of what those burrs are trying to give us, not the grounds, regrinding grounds and causing more uh, tribo electrification, if you remember. Okay. I installed SSP HU burrs in my DF64 two days ago. They are perfectly aligned according to the marker test. However, everything is all over the place. Yeah, so you may have not done the marker test in the best way. 
So I would I would maybe rerun the marker test. It's a little harder to do on the fellow ode for some reason. I've always had issues getting the first chirp. Um, it's weird. It's kind of weird. But uh, it also depends on what you mean all over the place. There, um, yeah. So I don't I don't super understand that. Yeah, mythos. That's the Simonelli mythos, which a lot of coffee shops use. I've gotten to a point where if I walk into a shop and they have a mythos, I probably am not ordering espresso because I know it'll be full of heat damage. You get a really astringent and drying finish on the end, even if it's an under-extracted shot. It doesn't matter. You're getting so much heat damage. And an easy way to test this, by the way, is get your least, whatever you think your least mashing grinder is, or if you have one grinder, that's fine too. Slow feed it, okay? Do slow feed on two different doses. That way, they're, it's constant. It's the same dose for both. Have it dialed into espresso. Take a heat gun or a hair dryer would work. Get a thermoprobe or a thermometer and heat up one of the doses until it hits like 70 Celsius, all right, to kind of give it a faux uh, heat damage. And then pull both shots. They'll still pull in the same time, but one will taste, if you let it sit on your tongue, it'll taste so much worse than the other. I've done this myself many times. I've done this to other people many times. There's an apparent massive quality dip when you're heating it up. It's losing tons of volatile aromatics and it's damaging the grounds themselves. Uh, let's see. I pulled a shot at setting 12. It pulled a bit too fast. Lowered it to 11 and it pulled in less than eight seconds. What's going on? Oh, well, so that's part of that's just the issue with the fellow ode in general because it's stepped. So you need to make it stepless. The steps are way too big to dial in, especially really lightly roasted coffees. Shoot. any to, Oh, yeah, there we go. So I talked about that. Uh, is it normal for SSP Caspers to produce more boulders than the other burr types? Potentially. So what's going on with the SSP burrs based off of what Hemro says is that it's more rolling the grounds than it is like mashing them. So I don't necessarily buy that, but that is what they say. So with those, the way that the burr geometry is, it could be releasing more coffee at bigger grind sizes due to those massive uh, gapes at the end. So those massive dips at the end. So there's a chance it could be doing that. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But again, this is something where you can go finer and slow feed it and it will give you undoubtedly a better result. And it will be even better if you have a coffee grinder that has a pre-breaker or a, an auger. I have a special lead and want to upgrade to espresso. What do you advise, Zerno or DF83? So you don't need to upgrade. The special lead will make good coffee. Now, if you're doing lightly roasted coffees, it's not the best with those with their burrs. If you're a home, if you're a, 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 a um, if you're a, um, if you're handy, if you're really handy, with special lead, it's really difficult. But if you're really handy, like really handy, you could actually um, drill three new holes into the burr carriers if you want. And you can make the ditting 54 millimeter steel burrs that go in the Vario fit in it. It's a bit, essentially the same diameter. It will fit in there, but the holes don't align. So if you are very handy and you want to drill some new holes, you could do that. Or you could go for the upgrade. But if you're friends with a machinist or something and you can get them to make the precise holes for you, or if you can do that yourself, if you have a, a studio, I mean, a um, some sort of garage, you know, you can do that as well. But um, out of the DF83V and the Zerno, uh, it really comes down to build quality. The DF83V, I've not got my hands on, but it looks very promising with that nice auger uh, and with the vertically mounted burrs. So it looks like it should do a really nice job. But um, the Zerno has blind burrs, so you're getting, uh, I, I think that's a big deal, is the blind burrs, and I, I'm, I don't know why more grinders aren't coming out with that. Um, I guess I do know, but anyway, so that's going to actually offset some of the difference in size, not all of it, but I did do a post a while back in, in Discord, we had a conversation about um, these differences, and some people did the math for me, I gave them the measurements of the holes, of the widths, everything, everything and we looked at this, the surface area, and honestly, yes, there is a big difference between 83 with screws and 64 without screws, but you're getting a much better build quality with the Zerno, and you're getting, um, it, it just really depends on what your preference is. I don't think you'll go wrong either way with those, but again, I've not used a DF83B. Going to pre-break my beans in a mortar before grinding. You should try that, sure. I don't know if doing it with a mortar is going to cause more fines due to the way you're breaking it uh, because you're using like blunt force going down as opposed to using a pre-breaker, which is doing it with little ribs. That was probably a more clean cut. So you're mashing it with a mortar, which might cause a lot of fines production as opposed to breaking it with a cut. <clears throat> so you have something like the tree-filled Kirimai that's coming out They've been teasing it for years. I've been trying to get one. But they have a cone at the top where when you feed the beans in, the cone doesn't have finishing teeth. It's just kind of ribs. And it pre-breaks the beans, falls into flat burrs that are blind that act as like finishing teeth. And so with that, they're cracking it. 
So you want to have a way of cracking it, not mashing it to do the pre-breaking. So honestly, a better way of doing it, if you really wanted to pre-break and try it out, is to take something like a, a hand grinder, go to the coarsest setting possible so it just cracks and it doesn't really experience the finishing teeth. So uh, you need to be able to get one that goes super coarse, though, like really, really coarse. You don't want it to experience finishing at all. You want it to bypass those finishing teeth. Uh, that would be a better way, I think, is cracking it as opposed to mashing it. Thoughts on the key. It looks like it is a much better grinder with the new evolution. And I've been told by people who've used it that it is impossible to stall now. Um, and But the thing is, is you have to like those 83 millimeter Mazer burrs, which I do not like at all. I think they're very, I don't think they really hit any sweet spot, honestly. I have the HG2 and I actually love it, but it's not because of the taste. It's because I, I am obsessed with the grinding of it, the manual aspect of it. It feels so good. It's one of those just luxurious items I'll use with like lower quality coffee when I'm pulling old vintage lever style shots. And it's strictly for the use case of it. I enjoy the aesthetic. I enjoy the actual grinding. I enjoy the feel of that manual grinder, but I don't like 83 mil burrs. So it's a very specific taste that is not, it doesn't really hit any specific sweet spot to me. It, it can't decide if it's, if it's wanting clarity, if it's wanting body, if it's wanting sweetness, it kind of just gives you a little bit of each in a very heterogeneous way, I guess. I have a DF64. I'm slow feeding for espresso. I'm also slow feeding for V6. You're clever. Should I do that for pour overs or is it throughput good enough that I don't have to? I would always slow feed, especially with no pre-breaking, um, with no pre-breaker at all. Maybe like a time war or something that has the, uh, the, the auger, you can get away without pre-breaking or, or without slow feeding for filter. Um, but I think it's always going to improve that it'll, it, it's more marginal the coarser you go, of course, because it's not going to get as stuck. But uh, the smaller the burrs you have, the the absence of any type of pre-breaking unit, the slower I'm feeding. All right. Is there a way to easily get rid of chaff with a hand grinder and does it have large impact on the cup? It does have a, a, a well, it depends on the coffees you're drinking. If you do really lightly roasted coffees or you do a lot of Ethiopias or ones that produce a lot of chaff, there will be a, a noticeable difference. I think how big it is depends on you and your, your taste preferences and whether or not you do not like that. So what you could do is over some days, blow out chaff and use a brush and scrape it and, and collect it. Collect the chaff over a few days and then one day cup it. Like put, if you can get like eight, grams of chaff over a week or so, put it into a bowl, add some hot water to it and just taste it and see. And then you can do a little AB as well. You can grind it. Don't remove chaff, grind some, remove the chaff and, and taste the, the differences and see if that uh, kind of astringent uh, dryness, um, like low quality green tea taste is in the one with the chaff. If it's not, don't bother with it. I do it when it's really chaffy coffees and I'm very uh, old school. I mean, I, I'm very lazy with it. I blow it out of my dose cup. So I use, I typically use my Zerno cup, which has really high walls and I shake and I spread it. So it has a bigger surface area along the side and I blow gently. Or if I'm grinding into something with a wider mouth, I actually do use my little hand vacuum and I just barely hover over the top. You could suck grounds up, so you want to be careful. But the chaff, if you shake enough of it up to the top, it's very light and it will want to go up with that before the heavier grounds do. Would a tilted foot 3D printed leg help with the F64? I don't think it would with that with that feed because it's, run, it's still running at 1400 RPM. It's going to go in and it's going it, to it's not really going to help with the feeding of it. It's still feeding directly into the center of those burrs. Love hacks that can help us get. Oh, good, good, good. Heard anything about Hansung regarding SSP uh, for 78? No, I have not heard anything. He's not uh, said anything other than posting that he received from my grinder. Um, I'm new to specialty coffee. Any recommended grind things for his V64 with the X Pro? Everything I'm making is so bitter. Go coarser. Go coarser. I know Reddit always says go finer. Don't listen to Reddit. Go coarser and maybe use less hot water. That's the, those are the first two things I would recommend. In the cupping video, you mentioned some coffees would work best with a lever style profile. Can you elaborate what that is using a flare? Sorry, not about grinder. That's fine. Um, so with lever styles, those are ones that I am going to, lever styles tend to work best with more medium to darkly roasted coffees. They can do well with light, but you want to make sure you've preheated it super, super well. And you might want to, um, you know, well, it just depends on your flavor, so we won't get super into it. But anyway, well, what I'm looking at with, with lever style profiles is because traditionally levers lose temperature pretty rapidly, um, especially during the extraction, and they're losing pressure, so the flow rate is going down. I... I like to get coffees that might have a little roast element to them or something that's just a little more developed uh, for those because they produce really nice thick shots that don't have a lot of that watery dry, drying um, end that comes out of traditional nine bar machines. When you pull a nine bar shot at the end, the flow rate's continually increasing with really hot water and it's causing a lot of those 
dry elements and it's pushing a lot of astringent art particles through the bed into your cut because of the ever increasing flow rate. With a lever, it's using the bed more efficiently as a filter and it's able to hold back a lot of those astringent particles. So you're lessening the astringency near the end of the brew. You're allowing it to maintain kind of its syrupy quality without overly watering it due to the higher flow rate forcing through the bed to dilute your coffee. So really it's just uh, things that I think might have a flavor profile I would like on espresso. And then I'm just looking at kind of roast degree, how it's acting. And it's not just optically the roast degree. You can also taste and see if the roast degree is where it's at. It could look really light, but have a bitter, bitter-ish taste to it. And that might be a good one to throw on lever style. Would you prefer an ode with MPS over DF64 with MP burrs? You mean with MP, I guess. And ode. So if we're doing filter the ode, I've always said this, and and, and now I have more uh, to kind of back with, but I, I, I've i always said the ode makes better filter with MP burrs than the uh, the, the D64, any of them. Um, I'm under, If I'm understanding this, if you use the same exact burr in two different grinders, the flavor may be different. I thought that the same burr set would taste the same regardless of the grinder it's in. No, not at all. They will absolutely taste different. And there's a multitude of reasons why. You have different uh, different motors have di are spec differently. So you might have undulations in your grinding as you're grinding on two different grinders. The specs of the tolerances, and not only tolerances, but how the, is, uh, the grinder is built for alignment are going to be vastly different. The feeding rate is going to be different between, say, the Gevy grinder, which has an auger, and say the DF64, which doesn't have one. So all of them are going to be different because the work that the DF64 MP burrs are going to do is much higher work than the work that a Zerno, for instance, is going to do. Those MP burrs in a Zerno have a much lower workload because some of the work has already been done for it and it's slowly feeding it. So that's even lessening the work more. It has more time, but it's less work to put in per second right? So they're going to taste completely different. And this is also something, if you have friends nearby that have 64 millimeter grinders, you can you can test this. But there have been loads of people testing it, and they have come to, uh, they, they've all also noted these massive flavor disparities. It's not all about the burr. A burr is one part of many in the creation of ground coffee and of, uh, of the taste of coffee. Um, let's see. I'm waiting about a minute off boil. Maybe I need to wait longer. Yeah, I would try waiting longer. And you can also buy a meat thermometer for like nine bucks. Uh, just the stainless stone that you just pop in there and you can get a good idea of what temperature you're at. And I would recommend doing that. Say I slow feed coffee through Sculptor 064S and DF64, both equipped with SSP. Would it still taste differently? Yes, absolutely. It will taste differently. No question. Can you explain a little about the differences between the burr materials? So when, when you say materials, are we talking tool steel versus cast? Or are we talking about finishing materials? Are we talking about coatings? Regardless, I'll talk about both. We have tool steel, which is very, very common, the most common. It's because it's easy to manipulate. It's very efficient and it is replicable. You have molds and it's easy to, to mold it and to heat it and to get it to where it needs to be once you do all the finishing of it. So tool steel also doesn't rust. It, it just has a long lifeline to it, life to it. And it's great. Cast is something that a lot of people swear by because they say it makes coffees taste sweeter due to a potential rolling effect of the grounds on the face of the burr. Absolutely no proof to this. There's not even any uh, proof with microscopic imagery or anything like that to prove that the grounds are more spherical. It's just a theory. Um, but they say that, you know, cast burrs can potentially create sweeter brews. And there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that point to this. A lot of people prefer their cast burrs due to this. So with cast, it's a lot harder to get perfectly flat burrs to get really high tolerances. There are claims that there are ways of creating cast burrs that are uh, very, very much in a very tight tolerance. So Hemro, for instance, claims, that's Malkonig and Ditting, they claim they have a process now of heating it to where they can get perfect replicability or nigh on perfect. And so that's what the EK43 burrs are, the lab suites are, all those are cast. Uh, so you have really cast and tool steel, which are the two main ones that people are using. Uh, so those are kind of the big differences there, I guess. Now, as far as coatings, that's a bit of a much different question. So with coatings, you have different coefficients of friction. But uh, as we see with Hinden's paper, it seems that the, most of the coatings that are currently on the market aren't causing that big of a difference. Arguably, DLC causes a difference with triple electrification um, and potentially other types of burrs like ceramic causes a big difference. So for instance, it might be the reason people love ceramics with darker coffees is because it's causing different static charge during the grinding, which is actually a good static charge for the grounds 
grains, causing less clumping, which can cause a better taste in coffee, but not with lightly roasted coffees, with darker coffees below 70 Agtron or below 60 Agtron. So ceramics is causing a big difference between the material of the burr and the actual grinding itself, whereas tool steel and, uh, and cast aren't causing those same types of differences within the static creation and the potential clumping effects, uh, or as Hoffa Daddy, Daddy Hoff likes to say, the, uh, the electro clumps. So hopefully that is a little helpful. No matter what recipe, I'm getting fast flow through 30 seconds or less on around 2.2 to 2.4. I don't know what grinder that's referring to. Worth noting, you can easily, uh, you can unplug the heating element on the Mythos very easy. Yes, you can. It still suffers greatly from a lot of heat up. It just does. Um, it's a DF64, not an ode. I I'm not sure what that one refers to. Sorry. Simonelli is Victoria Arduino. Same company. Correct. That's correct. Best 64 millimeter espresso burst for sweetness. Uh, that's really difficult because it depends on your perception of sweetness because, of course, we're not creating sweeter grounds. There's not like an abundance of sugar that's coming out. In fact, the sugar that's inherent in coffee is not actually detectable by the human palate. So when we say a coffee's sweet, it's some sort of perception we're having that we can't yet explain scientifically. Uh, there are a lot of posits uh, that, that people have made, speculations, but in reality, we're not sure where sweetness is coming from. But speculatively, I think uh, it, for 64 mils, I do like the Lab Sweet Burrs. I think the V2 do really really well on creating sweetness. And I think that's a very popular one to get sweeter tasting brews. So I'd probably just lean on that. Um, let's see. In a recent video, you talked about the uh, positive effects of mesh puck screens. Do you think the same positive effect translates to paper puck screens? No. So I talk about paper screens in that video as well. I have a ZP6 and love it for filter, but it can't go fine enough for espresso. That's correct. Would you recommend buying another easy presso grinder for espresso or buying an electric grinder? It really depends on your preferences, um, it, and it depends on your budget. That's a hard thing to say. Um, yeah, that's a hard thing to say. If you want to do manual, you can get some great manual grinders that do espresso really well, like the J-Max or the Kinu or something like that, or you could do electric. It just depends on your budget and what you're looking for. I've recently purchased the Pietro for filter and with the re release base, it's great. I'm now thinking it, it will also purchase a Cathlet robot and use my old Wilfie uniform for it. Will it be okay? Yeah, the Wilfie uniform will be okay for it as long as it's in good, uh, if it has a good life. Will the step adjustment be suitable for Cafe Lot? Yeah, the Cafe Lot has a lot more forgiveness because it's such a deep bed. So you don't need something super granular. Of course you can if you want to do really granular profiles with it. But if you're just pulling like normal espresso, especially if you're doing more uh, like a darker roast than Nordic or something, um, it will be more than good enough. Now, if you are doing something lighter, I would look into modding it to make it stepless. You should be able to do that easily. I've never used a Wilfa, but I can't imagine that it's not a very simple modification to make without having to know anything about drills or anything like that. You should be able to remove, uh, I'm, I'm imagining that there's still just a spring and a plug that you can remove to make it stepless and maybe you need some Teflon tape to not allow drift, but I would imagine it's something like that. Would you ever recommend 64 millimeter multi-purpose burst for espresso or is it mainly for filter like ZP6? It's great for espresso. It is good for espresso. Um, with, with the way that it is though, the um, they can generate a ton of heat because how small they are, relatively speaking, and because there's no true pre-breaker on it. They are, um, it's essentially two stages of cutting and so with that, you don't get um, a really nice pre-breaker. So you have a, uh, it, it slows the feed rate into the burrs down a lot, which is good. But because it's like that, it can also cause a lot of traffic jam if you're using more dense beans. So they're definitely best suited for lighter roasted coffees that are much harder, that are, that are going to be more difficult to enter the burrs. So it slows the feed rate down. But um, yeah, they do well for espresso, but it's a very specific espresso, not traditional. Would you ever, uh, does ceramic has the same dur durability issues as it happens in knives? Yes, the durability is not as good as the tool steel or cast steel. To simulate a breaking auger on a hand grinder, would you grind first on the coarsest setting before grinding at the correct setting? Yes, it's a lot of work, of course, but yes, absolutely. In fact, Brewer's Cup competitors have been doing this for years. It's not been like the, the reasoning behind these competitors doing it has not been for the benefits of regrinding, which can lessen boulders. It might increase fines, but it lessens boulders. The reasoning has been to remove the chaff. So a lot of a lot of uh, people will use a commandante because how coarse it can get, and they'll pre-break with the commandante. They'll put the grounds into like a groove where it has a mesh, and they'll sit there and blow out the chaff because the the bits of coffee are so big that blowing it, they're, none of them are going to fly out. They're so heavy. Then they'll reload it into their preferred grinder. A lot of times, especially in recent years, it's been Easy Presso ZP6. Uh, they'll load it into that for their correct grind setting because a lot of times the Easy Pressos don't go coarse enough to get those massive, massive chunks. You want it to go as coarse as possible with your hand grinder to do the regrinding. 
I have a DF64 and a 64S with stock burrs. I want to keep SSP burrs specifically for manual burrs and keep stock burrs on either of the grinders for espresso. Which of these grinders do you recommend should I put the SSP burrs in? So SSP is for manual burrs. I would put that in the 064S without question. Um, I'm doing that at 064S because you're going to get a much better. Well, that's also because I'm filter first. If you're espresso first, oh, whatever you're first, that's where I'm putting um, um, the 064S for. So if you're espresso first, you 80% espresso, throw in uh, stock burrs into the 064S to get a better experience on your espresso. Um, if you are filter first, then throw it in the 064S, the multi purpose burrs. Which of these grinders do you recommend? Should have. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, I'm late to the party. Sorry, Devin. We'll upload the video. How, is it hard, how hard is it to grind with a hand grinder for espresso? Uh, it's not that it's hard. It's just more time consuming. It takes 45 seconds to a minute or over a minute, depending on your hand grinder. But it's not necessarily hard. My MP grounds are always warm if I'm not slow, slow feeding. So I wouldn't worry about the, it depends on your grinder. So a big misunderstanding that could happen in this video that I want to go ahead and take away so you can't have this misunderstanding is measuring the temperature of the grounds as they exit. That is not a good indicator of how much heat is generated inside the burr chamber. It is not at all. All these grinders touch many different surfaces and, and various surfaces before they uh, before they release. For instance, in a niche grinder, they create a ton of heat, but when they come out, they're not as hot as say um, as say an EK43. The EK43 grounds feel really hot, but the big difference between these and, and the, why the EK43 is is still provably uh, creating much less heat is the grounds are touching nothing after they come out of the burrs in the EK. They literally go through a plastic chute into your cup within half a second. Whereas the niche, they're sitting around, they're rub rubbing around the inside of the grinder, they're losing heat to that steel chamber inside, and then they're going out and they are touching loads of surfaces that are leaching the heat from the grounds. So whenever you're looking at grounds in cup, that's not as good of, as, as of an indicator of the heat being... Uh, uh, created inside the bird chamber. That all being said, if you, <clears throat> if one day you take a cold grinder and you grind some coffee and you measure the temperature at a set specific grind setting, you measure it and you note it. And the next day you uh, switch burrs and you get the exact same grind setting and you grind coffee, the same coffee, and you measure the temperature and it is hotter, then yes, it's probably creating more, uh, creating more heat, which might mean that there's more regrinding going on. So in that case, if you're doing specifically that same grinder doing A, B at the same grind setting, then yes, you could have more heat generation and the, the end cup will tell you that. But if we're just talking in general terms, if you take a grinder here and a completely different grinder and grinder A has hotter grounds, that doesn't mean grinder A is producing more heat in the grinder itself, okay? Wanted to dispel that ASAP. What are the taste differences for espresso between a hand grinder and an electric grinder in general? You can have a hand grinder taste identical to an electric grinder. It really, it all depends on the construction of the grinder, the motor of the grinder, the RPM of the grinder, the burr geometry, how fast you're grinding it with your hand grinder, what angle you're using, the feed rate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the same thing as asking what's the taste difference between a flat and a cone. That's too vague of a description. It would need to be a much more specific thing. Like what's the taste difference between an easy presso ZP6 at a coarser grind setting versus a DF64 with SSP burrs at a coarser grind setting. That would be a more pointed thing, but then you could ask the same question about what's the difference between a niche zero at a coarse grind setting and a DF64 SSP at a coarse grind setting. So it's really, they're all grinders, they're all grinding coffee. There's no real generalities you can use to put them into different camps. The double cutting aspect of the MP burrs explains a lot as there's a ton of heat buildup from, from my first grind to my second grind, resulting in my second grind becoming extremely fine. Is there a reason? Your second grind is becoming extremely fine. That's actually very interesting. Um, are you feeding at the same rate? Because that seems difficult for me uh, to understand with, with limited, um, with limited explanation, the double kind of, okay, there's a ton of heat buildup for my first grind and my second grind. The, the burr should not get that hot. If you grind once, the burrs are not becoming scorching hot at all. It takes a lot of repetition to make the burrs really hot. So I would say it's the heat up is not causing a finer grind on the second one. That's not at all causing the issue. Um, potentially, if you're not expelling all of the grounds from it, if you're not using bellows, potentially there is some uh, buildup in the, the burrs themselves or something that is causing the second dose to not release quickly. And then you could have regrinding. But the heat up, let me reiterate this to make it very clear. The heat up whenever I'm talking about these burr heat ups, it's not about the burrs. It's the grounds rubbing against grounds causing the heat. 
Okay. So it's not the birds causing the heat in a commercial setting. Yes. The birds get really hot. So when I was talking about the mythos, that is the birds also getting really hot. So they're artificially heating the birds, uh, which you can uh, disable, but uh, they're artificially heating the birds so that you don't have that difference in grind size. Whereas at home, there can be a difference in grind size from heat up of burst if you're pulling like 20 shots. If you're doing two shots, it should not be an issue. There could be, there could be, um, the shoot could be clogging or something could be clogging to cause more regrind. So the grounds grinding themselves in the burst taking essentially a longer throughput could be causing finer grounds. Um, let's see. If it is if the heat is okay, how does it differ from heat damage? So the heat damage is because you're you're creating much higher heat at the time of fracture in the burrs itself. So yes, heat in the cup is indicative of heat being created, but heat being created is inevitable. Whenever grounds are cut, heat is created. Like that's energy being released, which is a necessity. It has to be released. So arguably you could use frozen beans and cut down on a lot of the heat damage, uh, which would make a lot of sense, obviously. But there is heat created when the ground is cut. And then when the ground's cut again, then again, then again, then again, then again. And then when the grounds are rubbing against themselves, it's causing friction and it's causing more heat generation. But a lot of that can dissipate before it hits the final cup. You're getting heat generation regardless. There's nothing you can do about it. Potentially fr freezing the beans can help help a lot. There's been speculation that RDT could help with that, but I've not seen any proof of that. Uh, obviously, I believe frozen will absolutely help with heat damage, uh, but it is going to affect other uh, um, aspects of grinding because of the way that the, uh, the there's like um, the water inside has been frozen. It's going to cause different. It's just it'll cause a different particle distribution. And it's been shown that it creates more super fines, like more micro fines, but they're more consistent. Right. So anyway, the the, the heat is going to happen. It's inevitable. Um, the heat in the cup, it's, it's arguably better to get it cooled down as rapidly as possible. You don't want the grounds in the cup to stay hot because that can continually cause issues. So maybe if you whisk it really quick with a WDT, which I would recommend anyway, or something, a spoon or anything that has a big thermal mass, if you do a quick stir to quickly dissipate the heat, that's going to help as well. So everything to, to that. So yes, you want, you want the grounds cooled down immediately. Uh, so even if you use a frozen Kutch cup or something, I mean, that that's ridiculous. Don't, you don't have to do that um, because once it melts and you get condensation, it'll cause the grounds to stick. That's annoying. I'm just saying, uh, yes, you do want the grounds to get cooled down, but um, the heating that's the biggest issue is in the grind chamber. That's where it's experiencing much hotter temperatures. How slow is so feeding? A bean at a time or a small number of beans at a time? It's obviously a spectrum. Any, any feeding that's slower than your normal dump in is slow feeding, right? So anything that's faster than dump is slow feeding. So you could slow feed where it's like three taps and they're all in, or you could sit there and tap, 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 letting a couple beans trickle at a time, or you could do bean by bean. That's ridiculous. And I would never do that because I'm not that patient, but I do take, I, I take probably five to eight seconds. Tap, 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 tap. And it does make a very noticeable difference, especially, especially in espresso and finer grind settings. New coffee metal. Let's put green beans in 300 degrees hot water to roast coffee during grinding. Let's do it. I think you mentioned in a previous video about having a bellows with a small aperture. Is that acting as a slow feeder? Yes. Yeah, so I have that somewhere. But the slow, yeah. So what that is acting as is I have a um, a three D printed piece at the bottom that's about this big, and so it doesn't allow a lot of beans to go through at a time. The issue is sometimes if two beans fit just right, it can it can kind of cause a stall, and you need to put your finger in. It's not dangerous. You're still like this far away from the burrs because the it sits on top of where you feed beans in. But essentially, what it is is it's causing like an hourglass situation where only a few beans can trickle in at a time. Uh, so you can do something like that. Or you could have, there's a 3D printed one I saw for the Levercraft Ultra years ago, where you kind of crank a handle and it causes a little corkscrew to kind of feed it like it's an auger to feed the beans into the grinder itself. Liquid nitrogen submerge the grinder. Yes, that would be the way to do it. Or you could be like Proud Mary where they have the hoppers in a freezer. Uh, so they just fill up the hopper, it's in a freezer and it grinds, but you need to put the grinder in it, baby. What hand grinder would you recommend for espresso for light roasted coffee and a BDB with Slayer mod? Body is not important for me. I want high clarity, flavor, separation, sweetness. Probably K-Series from uh, Easy Presso and get the one with the most granular adjustments. I can't remember it off the top of my head which one that is. That or the X-Pro would do really well, and it's got some pretty granular adjustments. But those both do really well with lighter coffees. 
water cooling bombers. Yeah. You mentioned why, uh, why have an opinion on why there are not more bombers care to elaborate. seems obvious to me that removing the screws would add significance. Yeah. To consistency. It's because they're, they're, uh, there are very few burr manufacturers in the world and like none are making blind burrs. You have a couple that have, but uh, they're not really making it. So if a grinder company that doesn't make burrs, which is the majority of them, 99% do not, they don't have anyone to make it for them. And maybe the burr manufacturer doesn't see one grinder company wanting them as enough to uh, warrant it. On top of that, you, um, on top of that, you have it's a little bit more difficult to create the grinder and the grinding ha grinder housing with um, with a way to create uh, to make the burrs screwless. It's much easier to have the top screws on in constructing the grinder itself. You would have to, and a lot of people have already, or a lot of people are not really aware of the benefits of them and don't see a big need for it, which I think is a bit silly. People get all up in arms if there is a ding. Like I'll see pictures on Home Barista or on uh, Facebook or Instagram, whatever, of people posting up close pictures of new burrs and there will be a tiny little ding in a finishing teeth. And they say, oh, this is defective. I need to send it back, which yeah, it is defective and that's not great. But then you'll see people saying, oh, that's going to ruin your coffee. You believe that one little ding in a finishing tooth is going to ruin your coffee, but you have three massive gaping screw holes with screws inside of it where it's good grief. It's about three fourths of a centimeter big. And the, the coffee is going to hit that and is going to break based off of those screw heads. Like that is obviously a much bigger problem than the little dings. So it is causing a big difference. And so I definitely recommend using blind burrs, but th that, that causes people to completely uh, change the design of their grinder to have back screws. Or a big issue is the first ones that really did it, in my, to my knowledge, is the EG1 with Weber. And they use little pins and heavy-duty magnets. But of course, that might not be ideal because grounds can get behind them. They can kind of shift a bit. Uh, so I, uh, then Bentwood came out with their blind burrs, and they have big, long back screws in order to screw it in from behind, which I think is definitely the way to do it but it, it causes for different engineering different designs let's see um for poor filters like the wave of spirit do you recommend taking advantage of the increased flow rate by grinding finer i don't ever want to grind finer my goal is to always grind coarser as coarse as possible uh while still maintaining that good good flavor um i've been using a eureka nota for a long time then i got easy press okay ultra and i really like the espresso i get from it what do you think it's conical versus flat um no, I would not say it's conical versus flat because the K Ultra is actually giving you more of a traditional or an, or a stereotypical flat burr profile than the Eureka Nota. The Nota actually does a better conical profile than a lot of cone burrs do as far as giving you big chocolatey uh, syrupy bodies. The K Ultra does a better job at light roasted coffees than the Nota will do. So that is not a traditional cone, cone versus flat. In fact, in that position, I would flip them. And if I had a spectrum of cone versus flat, I would put the K Ultra more the flat side and the note to more on the cone side. Um, thoughts on freezing beans in general. Does freezing at peak help with retain peak? Yes. I mean, freezing is always best. If you can single dose and freeze, maybe get like the bean sellers, like Weber bean sellers, or if you want to get the knockoffs, freezing and single doses is that's like, if you can do it, do it. No questions asked. I don't do it, but it's only because I already am so limited on space and I don't feel like buying and I'm so anal. I would need to buy like a commercial freezer that gets down to like negative 60 or something. And I would need to buy like thousands of tubes because I have so much coffee. And honestly, I go through so much coffee as is. I just don't have the patience to go and single dose them all. But if I were just a normal home enthusiast, not degrading normal, it's because I'm always testing something at all times. So I'm not normal in the sense that I don't just have a morning routine where I come and I can nerd out on my one or two or three cups of uh, cup, uh, coffee daily. I go through a ton of crap. So um uh, if I were to be just like a normal home enthusiast, I definitely would get bean sellers, single dose my bags of coffee, throw it in the freezer. You can do a normal home freezer uh, and that and that's going to be great. How big of a deal is having the red speed coating rubbed off on a portion of your beer? It's not a big deal. It is a slightly lower coefficient of friction, but what's going to happen is uh, that area might be a bit sharper than where the red speed is. Uh, the red speed actually kind of dulls the sharpness of the tool steel underneath. And once it's exposed, it's kind of like you're going through another seasoning period, but it's not that big of a deal, I don't think. <clears throat> Can you burr align hand grinders, say Easy Presso? Here's the thing with hand grinders. I would not worry about aligning them, especially, especially when you have the burr affixed to an axle. OK, so this is um, one of my big things when I'm looking at hand grinders that are cones. I do not want a hand grinder personally. If the cone burr is not affixed to the axle, I don't want it. It needs to be affixed to it, not floating. 
And two, I need external clicks. I don't want those little internal stupid things. Those are two big things for me when I'm buying a hand grinder. So with the Easy Pressos, uh, this is something a lot of people don't understand. When you have, when you have that burr affixed to an axle, okay, and you're a lot of people use the the burr lock to burr rub thing to kind of show how aligned their hand grinder is. That shows you nothing. It shows you nothing. Okay, let me say it again. That shows you nothing. All right. Whenever if some people will go until their burlock and they'll see how many clicks until there's no more rub. All right. And they're like, oh, yeah, it was only it was five clicks to no rub. I'm so aligned. Oh, mine was only 10 clicks. Mine's less aligned than yours. No, it's not. Whenever beans are going through, they're wanting to go out as evenly as possible because every area, every edge is a potential exit. So an edge that has more grounds built up trying to exit is not the area of least resistance. And the burrs, the grounds are going to keep going until they can find a place to go through easily. So as you're grinding the burrs, the burr essentially self-aligns if the grinder is built well. So with Kinus, with Easy Pressos, those are built well enough to where the burr is going to essentially self-align. So I would not worry about that. Same thing with like the Pietro with the flat burrs. It's going to essentially self-align as you put it in there because the beans themselves are going to push the burrs out and they're going to push out as much as possible. And if it pushes it out all, on all sides of that cone burr, it's going to situate evenly in order to have the most efficient. The, the, essentially, all these systems crave efficiency. And so they're going to push those out. It's the same thing with flat, flat burr grinders. There's always slop in the threads. That's why... You can grind where you think burr chirp is. You can grind there and it's not at burr chirp anymore. And it's because the, there's slop in the threads that push the burrs out ever so slightly when it's filled with beans. So when the grinder is under load, the marker test is not as accurate. It pushes those burrs out and it could cause misalignment. Who knows? That's why the marker test is not necessarily ideal. Would you say the differences between the Time Warrior 7 8 and the EG1 with Ultra Burrs are worth the premium? Also, do you think it's feasible to change burrs on EG1 between beverages when having guests? So uh, it, it's definitely feasible. It's four screws. If you're using magnetic burrs, it's four screws and that's it. So it's very, 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 very easy. Now, is it worth the premium? It really depends on your financial situation. I think if you're someone who's this is your number one hobby and you have, you know, you got a little egg you're sitting on. Sure. I absolutely, I am a big, big proponent of really enjoying your coffee. If you can really enjoying your coffee experience. I love premium feel. I love, I love, I enjoy enjoying what I'm doing. Right. And honestly, that's why I don't use hand grinder super often is most of the time I don't enjoy laboriously hand grinding. Uh, I don't, I, I enjoy slow feeding though. It's actually kind of meditative. So I love the feel of my EG1. Uh, that's very bougie to say, but the, the premium luxurious experience, I really do enjoy it. I enjoy it very much. Uh, so it's fun to use that. Um, but I think the taste quality, it is higher out of the EG1 with ULFs, but I would say for the majority of people on the planet, it is not worth the premium from the 078. The 078 is incredibly good. And I stand on that. And I still stand on it since my January video last year. It is a very good grinder. I actually have loaned it to a friend who's opening a cafe. He's going to be using it until his Ditting Lab Suite comes in. And I'm sure he's going to be sad when it's gone. Uh, should you season your 078S grinder? Uh, well, if you're doing pour overs, it is going to taste a lot better once seasoned. With espresso, it still will taste better when seasoned, but I don't think you need to waste a lot of coffee. If you are going to do that, go to Costco or go somewhere like that, buy bulk crap coffee. Um, Hansung, for instance, always recommends seasoning with oily, dark coffees. It's easier on the burrs. It's still going to help dull the burrs, which is the goal of, of seasoning. And to go ahead and say it, seasoning does matter. We won't get into it here. Uh, trust me for now, but seasoning does matter. Every grinder has a different period of seasoning, but it will improve your coffee the more you run through it to a certain extent. Okay. <clears throat> You're never going to catch up on the chat on this one. Too much for questions. I'm caught up. Always freezing small Ziplocs of 18 to 20 grams. Yeah, that's great. Uh, um, but sucking it out can suck out some of the volatile uh, aromatics. So it's actually, it would be ideal to use and more sustainable to use bean cellars. I have 10 different coffees in rotation in the freezer. I love that. What about freezing in bigger doses? I'll eat coffee for use in one week. Freezing bigger doses is fine, but the issue is once you open it, you're exposing it and they start to thaw and then you have to refreeze it. Um, so that's a little problematic. You want it to be cut off from oxygen right when you freeze it. That's going to help the peak. Once you allow new oxygen to come in, it's going to continue oxida oxidation. Um, all right, I'm going to do... I'm at an hour and two. I want to end this. I'm going to do the ones that are currently on uh, and anything else that comes on, I'm not going to answer because I need to hop off. Um, what about freezing? The, oh yeah. Beans going stale aside. I'd love to see a comparison between hopper fed and single dosing from a grind quality perspective. It seems there might be some benefits to that consistent weight feed rate. There is benefits for consistency in a shop. For taste, there is no benefit. 
Okay. So the weight pushing down on it is going to give you more consistency. Well, that's actually not necessarily true. If you slow feed and you match the feed rate every time, it's going to give you the same consistency. Single dosing where you dump it all in, that will be inconsistent because the beans will interact all at once in different ways every time. So when you do shot to shot consistency, yes, the weight is going to help. And that's why Ozik actually has a weighted plunger you can put behind his new Ozik grinder that will follow the dose in to give constant pressure behind. So it has uh, identical particle size distribution throughout the grinding process. But as I said, single dosing is still going to be supreme for taste. Even if it's inconsistent, it's going to be supreme for taste, If you slow, especially if you slow feed. Um, I've been craving 98 millimeter brew burrs. They were so good. Yeah, they are so good. Could be a fluke, but I just did test with fast feeding and slow feeding on the side too. And my slow feed finished 40 seconds before the fast feed. Fast feeding and slow feeding on the side. Gen 2 and my slow feed finished 40 seconds before the fast feed. No, that's not a fluke. That I'm telling you, it, it goes a lot faster. A lot faster. A lot. And it's because it is a more efficient throughput. So it doesn't have to wait for the grounds in front of it to exit. And so it sits there and it just regrinds and regrinds and regrinds until it's able to exit. And then the grounds are really small. All right. Thank you so much for watching today. I will have this uploaded shortly. I need to take a cute little thumbnail photo. But um, for those of you watching in the future, make sure you check out my main channel. Make sure you subscribe to this. Make sure you hit the like. May leave a comment once this is loaded or if it's loaded, leave a comment, whatever. Uh, thank you so much. I hope you all have a fantastic new year. I hope that this was educational and helpful because um, that's what I try to do here. We have some fun. We, we take unlimited questions. And uh, yeah, if you want to get in on the next one, you know, you can check out the Patreon in the link below because uh, this is only available if the live stuff is available for Patreon. But then, of course, we post it afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And today, I hope that you brew something tasty. And cheers.